uh, in the future uh, when we can. So um, it's almost 6.05, so we might as well um, get, get down to the beginning. Uh, we have probably a few people left to come in, um, but I um, will be admitting them as we go. So um, I think we can probably uh, start. So I'll, I'll just uh, introduce and say uh, thank you very much for coming to this this event from Pushkin House. Um, we've uh, it's it's the latest in our series of Pushkin Club uh, poetry readings, which we're very very honoured to have um, organised by the Pushkin Club and David Bromel um, in uh, specifically, who's uh, done a lot of the work for it. Um, he will be reading part of the poetry tonight, as well as giving an introduction uh, to each poem. And um, alongside him, we have uh, also reading in English, Lucy Daniels, uh, another longtime member of the Pushkin Club, and Ali Gelich, who many of you probably already know um, from her recitations of poetry. She's uh, um, a, a sort of one of our absolute uh, top rocks that we rely on here. Um, a couple of little housekeeping things, which is that um, please make sure to keep your mic muted for, for the duration until, until the end. Um, and that if you don't want to be seen on camera to turn your camera off, um, please put your questions in the chat. And um, when David shares his screen to, to show his presentation, the best way to view it is to um, have your viewing settings as um, standard speaker, um, which you can change at the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, though it's, it's, it's not uh, mandatory, but we suggest uh, viewing it that way. Um, so without much further ado, I'll um, hand over to David. Um, Thank you very much, David. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rafi, um, for that kind introduction. And good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, many students of Russian poetry uh, consider that Alexander Bloch um, is the greatest Russian poet uh, since Chuchev. He was the outstanding poet of the Russian symbolist movement, which inspired a spectacular renaissance of art and literature uh, during the two decades before the revolution in 1917. And he exercised a profound influence on both his contemporaries and his successors. He was first and foremost a lyric poet who regarded his work as a single poetic diary. One of the most striking features of his verse is its musicality. His poetry also has great breadth in the sense of different keys or tones in which he could write and in the wide range of subjects he covered. In the course of the next hour or so, uh, Lucy, Alla and I will be reading uh, 13 poems. And with these, we hope to give you an idea of the beauty and range of Bloch's verse. He had an active literary life of only 20 years, yet managed to crowd into that short period half a dozen dramas, including Balaganchik, uh, The Fairground Booth, and The Rose and the Cross, numerous articles and countless reviews, but most of all, over 1,000 poems. Alexander Bloch may be regarded as the first great Russian poet of the 20th century, on a par with Mandelstam, Akhmatova, Svetaeva, and Pasternak. Um, he was born on the 16th of November, 1880, in St. Petersburg. And next month is the um, 140th um, anniversary of his birth, um, hence the celebration uh, this evening. Uh, he, he was born into a family of gentry of great intellectual and academic distinction on both his mother's and his father's side. He was brought up by his grandmother's family, the Beckertots, in St. Petersburg, 
and on the family estate of Shakhmatova, uh, which is 40 miles outside Moscow. Uh, Bloch's parents are separated soon after his birth. His mother and maternal grandmother were both very strong influences on his early upbringing. And he remained very close uh, to his mother uh, throughout his life. Uh, Bloch wrote later, he was shielded from life's coarseness by women's tender care. On byl zabojtoj ženšin nježnoj od gruboj žizni agrazdion. Uh, the next uh, slide, this slide shows the young Bloch in the company of his great grandmother, his grandmother, his mother, and his aunt Katya, the women who raised him. On finishing school, um, Bloch initially enrolled in the Faculty of Law at St. Petersburg University, as he later said, uh, because it was the easiest. Uh, the summer of 1901, Bloch called his mystic summer. It was during this time that he realized how deeply uh, in love he was with the woman who was to become his wife. Uh, this was Lyubov Mendeleeva, the daughter of the great chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev. Uh, that's a picture, obviously, of uh, Lyubov. Uh, towards the end of the summer of 1901, Bloch decided to transfer from the Faculty of Law to the Philological Faculty and devote himself uh, to the study of literature. This very fine building is the Philological Faculty at uh, St. Petersburg University. Uh, Bloch had found his true vocation. Uh, he married Lyubov Mendeleeva in 1903. Uh, that's Lubov at the time of her marriage uh, to Bloch. And in his own time, Bloch became a kind of legendary figure, an embodiment of the stereotype picture of a poet, uh, with his curly hair, long lean face, dark coat and flowing time, a tie, and his mournful, penetrating and intelligent eyes. There is the portrait of the romantic poet. It was the critic uh, Viktor Zhirmonsky, who in 1921 described Bloch as the last romantic poet. And there are many features to his verse, which we readily associate with romanticism. Its beautiful lyric quality, its musicality, and the constant yearning for an ultimately unattainable ideal. Also, there's the powerful influence of the mystical religious philosophy of Vladimir Solovyov and the symbolist poets Andrei Bieli and Vyacheslav Ivanov. Uh, symbolism, as many of you will know, is the name given to the romantic movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which is chiefly associated with the literatures of France and Russia. It was born of a reaction against the rationalism and materialism of the 19th century. Uh, the symbolist poets in Russia followed two main directions, the aesthetic and the religious. Uh, the aesthetic group, who are also referred to as the decadence, is generally associated with the early symbolist poets. They regarded art as the highest form of human experience and reacted to the utilitarian strain found in the verse of the so-called civic poets, like Nekrasov. Uh, Nekrasov is famous for the statement, uh, which he made in verse, uh, you do not have to be a poet, but you have to be a citizen. Instead, the aesthetic strand of symbolism preached art for art's sake. Uh, the leading lights of the religious group were the, were the writers Zinaida Gipios and her husband, Dmitry Merishkovsky along with the symbolist poets of the younger second generation, Alexander Bloch, Andrei Bieli, 
and Vyacheslav Ivanov. Uh, for them, art was part of a, a religious or mystical quest. The artist was seen as a mystic, endowed with the ability to penetrate into the mysterious essence of phenomena and to hear and reproduce the hidden music of nature. However, Bloch himself remained indifferent to literary groups and schools. In August 1907, he wrote to Andrei Bieli, I do not concern myself with the construction of literary and philosophical theories, and I resist and will continue to resist firmly all attempts to draw me into a school. He was certainly not an experimentalist in the manner of a Mayakovsky or Klebnikov. As Mandelstam strikingly put it, in literary matters, Bloch was an, an enlightened conservative. He was exceedingly cautious with everything concerning style, metrics, or imagery, imagery, not one overt break with the past. To see Bloch as an innovator in literature is to picture an English lord introducing with great tact a new bill into parliament. On one view, the goal of the romantic poet is the search for the true love, the one and only love. It is this search for love as an ideal to strive for, which can be traced as the common thread uh, through the different stages of Bloch's uh, poetic uh, development. It's possible to view uh, Bloch's poetic development as a series of stages in which the ideal he seeks in this search for love assumes a number of different forms. I'm acutely conscious that any kind of classification is, is bound to be arbitrary, uh, but there are perhaps uh, five such stages in Bloch's case. First, uh, the motif or theme of the beautiful lady, then the theme or motif of the stranger, which is linked uh, with the snow maiden and Carmen. Thirdly, uh, the, the idea of the terrible world. Fourthly, Russia. And fifthly, the revolution. We'll be reading poems uh, which illustrate each of those five stages of political development, of um, poetic development. In addition, I should mention the influence of the Pushkinian tradition, which permeates uh, Bloch's poetry uh, through all its stages. Uh, Bloch's first vision of romantic love was expressed in his first volume of 105 poems, Stihi o Prekrasnoi Damie, uh, verses about the beautiful lady. Uh, this vision had developed from the philosopher Vladimir Salevyov's idea of the eternal feminine, das ewig weiblicher, or in Russian, vietnaya jensmanist. Uh, Bloch had first come across the philosopher and poet uh, Vladimir Salavyov and his ideas while still in his teens. Uh, Salavyov became Bloch's first spiritual mentor. Uh, Salavyov had developed the concept of the world soul, Miravaya Dusha, and as just mentioned, the idea of the eternal feminine. According to Salavyov, the world soul or the eternal feminine once it had penetrated the world deeply enough, would transform and redeem it. Bloch's first vision of romantic love in the form of the beautiful lady uh, was inspired in part by Salvyov's idea of the eternal feminine and in part by Bloch's love for his wife, Lubov. As I said, uh, Bloch's first collection of verse was entitled Verses About the Beautiful Lady. Uh, this uh, collection was published in 1905, though many of the poems in it were written much earlier. In the poems in this first volume, Bloch depicts himself as the beautiful lady's humble and obedient servant, as the queen's slave, Servus Reginae. But Bloch's verses were also suffused with the sense that his ideal of the beautiful lady is utterly unattainable. 
One of the most beautiful poems uh, in this first volume is I Visit Dark Churches, which we'll now read. I go into dark churches. I perform a plain, humble rite. There I wait for the beautiful lady in the red icon lamps flickering light. In the shadows by a tall column, I start at the creak of the door. But what captivates me is a candlelit icon, a candlelit vision of her. I am used to the robes that are worn by the majestic eternal bride. On the corners high above me, smiles, visions, and fairy tales glide. O oh, holiest, how soft is the candlelight, how consoling thy features are. I hear no sign or voices, but I believe, dearest one, thou art here. Хожу я в темные храмы, совершаю бедный обряд. Там жду я прекрасной дамы в мерцании красных лампад. В тени у высокой колонны дрожу от скрипа дверей, а в лицо мне глядит озаренный только образ, лишь сон о ней. О! Я привык к этим ризам величавой вечной жены. Высоко бегут по карнизам улыбки, сказки и сны. О, святая, как ласковы свечи, как отрадны твои черты. Мне не слышны ни вздохи, ни речи. Но я знаю, милая ты. Uh, between Bloch's first and second books lies the difficult period of the years 1904 to 1906. The disastrous uh, Ru Russo-Japanese War of 1904 had huge political repercussions on the situation in Russia. And 1905 was the year of Russia's first social revolution. These were years which could not fail to have an impact on anyone with any sensitivity. As, as Bloch was to recall in 1910, as something broke in us, so something broke in Russia. And Russia turned out to be our own soul. In Bloch's uh, second collection of poems, Unexpected Joy, Nyechayanaya Aradist, the signs of duality discernible in his first collection intensify. For the first time, demonic elements break into his poetry. Contemporary, uh, the image of the heavenly beloved has now receded into the past and contemporary motifs begin to appear in his poems. The city at night, flooded with electric lights, the noise of all night restaurants, and the faces of flesh and blood women. A new image enters Bloch's verse under the name of the stranger, Niezna Komka. Uh, Bloch wrote the poem with this title, The Stranger, Niezna Komka, in April 1906. This slide um, shows the station restaurant in Ozerki, which inspired the poem, The Stranger. In the poem, The Stranger, a woman whom the poet meets by chance in a restaurant at night is transformed into the mysterious unknown lady. 
Lucy will now read a shortened uh, version of The uh, Stranger in English, and Ada will read uh, the original uh, Russian. The Stranger. Above the restaurants in the evenings, the sultry air hangs close and stale, and the sounds of drunken shouts float on the putrid breath of spring. And every evening in my glass, I see my one and only friend, reflected in the mysterious bitter liquid, subdued and dazed like me. Close by me, at the neighbouring tables, sleepy waiters hang about, and drunkards with rabbit's eyes in vino veritas shout out. And every evening, at the appointed hour, or is it just a dream? A girlish form tightly clad in silks moves across the misty window pane. Slowly she threads her way among the drunkards, never escorted, always alone, and breathing out mists and perfume, sits by the window on her own. And her smooth silks and her hat with its black plumes of mourning and her slender hand adorned with rings are redolent of ancient legends. Mesmerised by her strange presence, I look beyond her dark veil and see a far enchanted shore and a remote enchanted realm. Obscure secrets are entrusted to me. Somebody's son is made my own and deep into my soul's recesses the bitter wine has gone. Drooping ostrich feathers are swaying in my brain and fathomless blue eyes are radiant on that faraway shore. In my heart, there is a treasure. The key is vouchsafed to me. You are right, you drunken monster. I know truth should be sought in wine. Незнакомка в сокращении. По вечерам над ресторанами Горячий воздух дик и глух И правит окликами пьяными Весенний и тлетворный дух. И каждый вечер друг единственный В моем стакане отражен и влагой Терпкой и таинственной, Как я смирен и оглушен. А рядом у соседних столиков Лакеи сонные торчат, И пьяницы с глазами кроликов «Эн вино веритас!» кричат. И каждый вечер в час назначенный Иль это только снится мне девичий стан, шелками схваченный, в туманном движется окне, и медленно пройдя меж пьяными, всегда без спутников, одна, дыша духами и туманами, она садится у окна. И веют древними поверьями Ее упругие шелка. И шляпа с траурными перьями, И в кольцах узкая рука, И странной близостью закованный Смотрю за темную вуаль И вижу берег очарованный. И очарованную даль Глухие тайны мне поручены, Мне чье-то сердце вручено, 
и все души моей излучены пронзило терпкое вино. И перья страуса склоненные в моем качаются мозгу, и очи синие, бездонные, цветут на дальнем берегу. В моей душе лежит сокровище, и ключ поручен только мне. Ты права, пьяное чудовище, я знаю, истина в вине. The image of the blizzard in Russian Matiel or Vyuga as a symbol of passion and of the elemental appears frequently during the second stage of Bloch's poetic development. It also conveys a sense of having lost one's way, of being without direction or purpose, and also quite simply of cold. The blizzard motif is particularly powerful in the snow mask, a cycle of 30 lyrics written in a period of intense creativity over 16 days in December 1906 and January 1907. Here, the poet abandons himself to flight through the void in pursuit of his enticing beloved. In this new feminine uh, creation of his fantasy, the stranger and the beautiful lady seem somehow to be mysteriously intertwined. Uh, the cycle, the snow mask, was inspired by a real woman, Natalia Volokhova. Uh, Volokhova was an actress in the company run by Viera Komisarzewskaya with Sievolod Meyerholt as director, uh, Meyerholt being the driving force behind the company. Bloch was infatuated with Volokhova, and indeed the whole snow mask cycle is dedicated to her. Uh, Bloch portrayed their affair in a number of poems as a magnificent tragic play of self-destruction. Uh, Bloch first met Natalia in December 1906, like Lubov Mendeleeva, she, she seems to have become for Bloch a kind of medium through which metaphysical reality was revealed to him. But their stormy relationship lasted for only two years. It was Bloch's infatuation with Volokhova which played a significant part in his estrangement from his wife. However, by October 1907, Bloch had already ceased to derive any joy from his passion. The next poem we're going to read, uh, Spring Without End, Without Bounds, is taken from a cycle of poems titled Faina. This cycle was first published in March, 1908. It was also dedicated to Natalia Volokhova. The poem carried in manuscript the dedication to the woman who is poisoned by her own beauty. It introduces a change of mood, <clears throat> landscape and meter. The blizzard has ceased and joyfully the poet greets the spring. In the last three verses, he still welcomes his mystical love. However, his love is now mixed with hate. The first two lines of the second stanza read as follows. Failure, I accept you. And success, I accept you as well. English readers will no doubt be reminded of Rudyard Kipling's well-known poem, If. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Uh, Lucy will now read again a shortened version of this poem, and Ala will then read it in Russian. 
spring without end, without bounds. O oh, spring without end, without bounds, O oh, endless and boundless dream, I recognize you, life. I accept you and welcome you with the ring of my shield. Failure, I accept you, and success, I accept you as well. There's no shame in the enchanted realm of weeping or in the mystery of laughter. I accept the sleepless nights spent arguing, the morning light through the window's dark curtains, so that spring will intoxicate and dazzle my inflamed and weary eyes. And I met you on the threshold, a turbulent wind in serpentine curls, with the unfathomable get name of God on tightly pressed cold lips. In that hostile encounter, I will never surrender my shield. You will never bear your shoulders. Yet above us, an intoxicating dream. I look, I measure the rancor, hating, cursing and loving the pain and disaster I know do not matter, for I accept you. Из цикла заклятия огнем и мраком в сокращении. О весна без конца и без краю, без конца и без краю мечта. Узнаю тебя жизнь. Принимаю и приветствую звоном щита. Принимаю тебя, неудача, и удача тебе мой привет. В заколдованной области плача, в тайне смеха позорного нет. Принимаю бессонные споры, утро в зависах темных окна. Чтоб мои воспаленные взоры раздражала, пьянила весна. И встречаю тебя у порога с буйным ветром в змеиных кудрях, с неразгаданным именем Бога на холодных и сжатых губах. Перед этой враждующей встречей Никогда я не брошу счета, никогда не откроешь ты плечи, но над нами хмельная мечта. И смотрю, и вражду измеряю, ненавидя, кляня и любя. За мученья, за гибель. Я знаю, все равно принимаю тебя. Uh, this is a picture of a slightly uh, disheveled looking block. Uh, the next vision which captured Bloch's imagination was the wild chaotic world of the gypsy, symbolized by the figure of Carmen. The rhythms of gypsy song and dances are heard repeatedly in his poetry between 1907 and 1914. Tormented by his conflicting emotions, Bloch sought escape in wine and debauchery and felt himself drawn irresistibly into the violent, chaotic world of the gypsy. The key elements in the Carmen theme are heat, passion, and betrayal. As Mandelstam put it, Bloch assimilated the gypsy romance and turned it into a language of passion, understandable to all. The gypsy motif is powerfully evoked 
as the backdrop to the encounter, which is the subject of the next poem we're going to read, In the Restaurant. This poem was first published in November 1911 as part of the Terrible World, Strashny Mir cycle, in the third volume of his collective verse. Like the stranger, the poem describes an incident in a restaurant which seemingly has some basis in fact. A certain Maria Nalidova later claimed that she was the woman in the poem and that the episode had taken place in St. Petersburg's, St. Petersburg's famous restaurant, the Villa Rodet. However, the music of the verse, along with the colorful verbal metaphors, transmutes the actual incident into one charged with mystical suggestiveness. Uh, the poem builds up into an unforgettable climax in the final stanzas. in the restaurant. I shall never forget whether or not such an evening ever occurred. The pale sky had been burnt out and split apart by the fires of sunset and the street lamps were shining in its yellow light. I was sitting there by the window in a crowded room. Somewhere violins were singing of love I sent you a single black rose in a glass of i.e. as gold as the sky. You glanced over, embarrassed but boldly. I met your stare and bowed. You turned to your escort and said in a voice loud and clear, he too is in love. And the strings burst forth as in answer Frenziedly the violin sang, but you were drawn to me with your youthful contempt and a scarce visible move of your hand. You suddenly rushed past like a startled bird. You passed by as light as my dream. Your perfume sighed, your eyelashes fluttered and your silks whispered, anxious and soft. But still you glance back in the mirror as if to cry out, catch your prize. Her necklace jingling, the gypsy girl danced and wailed of love to the dawn. В ресторане никогда не забуду. Он был или не был этот вечер. Пожаром зари, сожжено и раздвинуто бледное небо, и на желтой заре фонари. Я сидел у окна в переполненном зале, где-то пели смычки о любви. Я послал тебе черную розу в бокале золотого, как небо, аи. Ты взглянула, я встретил смущенно и дерзко взор надменный и отдал поклон. Обратясь к кавалеру, намеренно резко ты сказала, и этот влюблен. И тотчас же в ответ что-то грянули струны. Иступленно запели смычки, но была ты со мной, всем презрением юным, чуть заметным дрожанием руки. Ты рванулась движением испуганной птицы, ты прошла, словно сон мой легка, и вздохнули духи. Задремали ресницы, 
зашептались тревожно шелка. Но из глуби зеркал ты мне взоры бросала и, бросая, кричала «Лови!» Аманиста бренчала, цыганка плясала и визжала заре о любви. Uh, the development of the gypsy theme culminated in March uh, 1914 in the cycle uh, titled Carmen, which was written in 14 days. Like the snow mask, the cycle was born of a veritable creative frenzy. Uh, the two cycles have a further affinity in that they were both composed at times when Bloch was under the spell of a, of a fascinating woman. In 1906, Natalia Volokova. In 1914, Lyubov Delmas, a celebrated opera singer, well known for her interpretation of Bizet's heroine. Uh, Bloch saw uh, Lyubov Delmas for the first time singing the Carmen role in October 1913. In March 1914, Bloch became personally acquainted with Delmas. He fell in love with her as soon as he met her. For two years, Bloch lived under her passionate spell. We will now read one of the poems inspired by her. Snowy spring is raging. Wushuyat Snezhnaya Vesna. Snowy spring is raging. Snowy spring is raging. I lift my eyes from my book. Oh, that terrible moment when she read Zuniga's palm and shot a glance at Jose. Her eyes lit up with mockery. She flashed a row of pearly teeth and I forgot all past days and nights and the blood rushed to my heart washing away the memory of the fatherland. And her voice sang, you will pay for my love at the cost of your life. Бушует снежная весна. Я отвожу глаза от книги. О страшный час, когда она, гадая по руке, Суниги в глазах Хозе метнула взгляд. Насмешкой засветились очи, блеснул зубов жемчужный ряд. И я забыл все дни, все ночи, и сердце захлестнула кровь, смывая память об отчизне. А голос пел, ценою жизни ты мне заплатишь за любовь. The mature poetry of Bloch's uh, third volume of verse contains some magnificent uh, penitential verse, especially in the cycle Retribution, Vazmezdia. The poem, Glory and Feats of Valor, is a particularly moving illustration of this group. The poem is addressed to his wife, Lubov, from whom at uh, the time, Bloch was estranged. He had first become estranged from his wife during the period in 1906, 1907, following his self-destructive infatuation with Natalia Volokhova. Other relationships had followed. Lubov then had a child by another man. It's not known who this was. Bloch nevertheless accepted the child as his own. The child died after only 10 days and Bloch wrote a very moving poem in commemoration. 
The poem is titled Nasmiet Nadienza, On the Death of a Child. Bloch's magnanimity and nobility of spirit come through very powerfully in this poem. In the poem, we are now going to read Glory and Feats of Valor, or Doblistjak, or Podvigak, or Slavie. Uh, Bloch expresses the sorrow of parting from Nibov and his acute feeling of loss. Their separation was seen by Bloch as a sign that his youth with its dreams and ideals had come to an end. For Bloch, his wife was still inseparably associated both with his youth and with the beautiful lady. The third and fourth lines in the fourth stanza of this poem have captured the imagination of many readers. I'll, I'll quote the lines in English. Forlornly wrapping yourself in your blue cloak, you left home and stepped out into the damp night. The sorrow and bitterness of separation or parting from a loved one are expressed with great poignancy. Marina Tsvetaeva said that after the appearance of Odoblestyak or Podvigak or Slavie, Sia Rasia Villa Ljubljana, Sini Plash, Lubovi Dmitrievni. All Russia was in love with the dark blue cloak of Lubov Dmitrievna. We will now read um, that poem. Glory and feats of valor in this miserable world I kept forgetting. Whenever your portrait in its simple frame shone in front of me. But the hour came and you left home. The cherished ring I flung into the night. Your fate you entrusted to another. And I forgot your beautiful face. Whirling in a cursed swarm, the days flew by. Wine and passion were ravaging my life. Then I remembered you before the altar, and I called you as if calling my youth. I called you, but you never once looked back. I shed tears, but you did not relent. Forlornly wrapping yourself in your blue cloak, you left home and stepped out into the damp night. I do not know what refuge you found for your pride, my darling, my dearest one. My sleep is sound. I dream of the blue cloak in which you stepped out into the damp night. No more dreams of tender love or glory. They passed away and youth has had its day. And so your portrait in its simple frame, with my own hand, I've taken away. О доблестях, о подвигах, о славе Я забывал на горестной земле, Когда твое лицо в простой оправе Передо мной сияло на столе. Но час настал, и ты ушла из дому. Я бросил в ночь заветное кольцо. Свою судьбу ты отдала другому, И я забыл прекрасное лицо. Летели дни, крутясь проклятым роем, Вино и страсть. Терзали жизнь мою, И вспомнил я тебя пред аналоем, И звал тебя, как молодость свою. Я звал тебя, но ты не оглянулась, Я слезы лил, но ты не снизошла, Ты в синий плащ печально завернулась. В сырую ночь 
ты из дому ушла. Не знаю, где приют своей гордыни ты, милая, ты, нежная, нашла. Я крепко сплю. Мне снится плащ твой синий, в котором ты в сырую ночь ушла. Уж не мечтать о, под... о нежности, о славе. Все миновалось, молодость прошла. Твое лицо в его простой оправе Своей рукой убрал я со стола. Uh, Bloch and his wife went abroad twice um, together before World War I, traveling through Germany, France, and Italy. The first journey in 1909 inspired some of Bloch's very best verse. These are the poems which appear in the cycle Italian Verses. The common feature of these poems is their classical restraint and solemnity. They evoke a vivid sense of history and have a striking pictorial, even sculpturesque quality. The most famous of these are the poems Ravenna and Florence. However, Bloch's um, Italian journey provided only a momentary respite from his restiveness and general dissatisfaction with himself. The third stage in Bloch's development is marked by despair, as illustrated by the section in his third volume of, of verse titled Terrible World, Strashny Mir. These poems are full of Bloch's hatred for his past, a lack of any hope about his future, and a growing sense of the absurdity and futility of existence. This is especially true of the next two poems we're going to read, How Hard It Is to Walk Among People, and Night, A Street, A Streetlight, A Pharmacy. Night, a street, a streetlight, a pharmacy is one of the five poems grouped under the generic title Dances of Death, Pieski Smirti. In this cycle, the poet portrays himself generally as a corpse amongst people for whom life and death are indistinguishable. Night, a street, a streetlight, a pharmacy is itself a brilliant encapsulation of the Nietzschean idea of eternal recurrence. The poem is an eloquent restatement in poetic form of the harrowing belief that mankind is doomed to a perpetual and endless repetition of the same purposeless existence. We'll now read these uh, two poems. Lucy will read first how hard it is to walk among the people. <laughs> How hard it is to walk among people. That person has been burnt to death, Afanatsyevyev. How hard it is to walk among people, pretending that you are not yet dead, telling of the tragic play of passions to those who are not yet living. How hard it is to stare your nightmare in its face and find harmony in the whirling chaos of feeling so that in the pale glow of art, those who are not yet living may see the destructive blaze of life. Там человек сгорел, Афанасий Фетт. Как тяжело ходить среди людей и притворяться 
не погибшим. И об игре трагической страстей повествовать еще не жившим. И вглядываясь в свой ночной кошмар, строй находить в нестройном вихре чувства, чтобы по бледным заревам искусства узнали жизни гибельной пожар. Night, a street, a street light, a pharmacy, a meaningless dull light. Even if you live another quarter of a century, nothing will change. There is no way out. You'll die. You'll start again from the beginning and everything will be repeated as before. The night, the icy ripples on the canal, the pharmacy, the street, the streetlight. Ночь, улица, фонарь, аптека, бессмысленный и тусклый свет. Живи еще хоть четверть века, все будет так. Исхода нет. Умрешь, начнешь опять сначала. И повторится все, как в стай. Ночь, ледяная рябь канала, аптека, улица, фонарь. Block was not purely an artist. He had a definite social conscience, as well as an acute sense of social guilt. His active interest in the social life of his times dates from 1907 and 1908, when he made a number of contributions to the debate that went on in the aftermath of the abortive revolution of 1905. He was particularly interested in the role of the intelligentsia in society and in its attitudes to the popular masses. Bloch believed that in the 19th century, educated European society had become overly scientific and rationalistic in its approach, thereby becoming divorced from nature and the spirit of music. The true bearers of culture, Bloch proclaimed, were now the popular masses who, unlike the intelligentsia, had continued to live in harmony with nature's rhythms. And like the Slavophiles in the 19th century, Bloch had come to believe that Russia had a unique role to play in the salvation of the modern world. Uh, those views I briefly outlined lead into the fourth stage of Bloch's poetic development, which reflects his deep love of Russia. Bloch's poems on Russia are to be found in the section entitled My Country, Rodina, in volume three of his collected works. This cycle reveals Bloch's passionate emotional involvement in the destiny of his country. The eternal feminine ideal which has manifested itself in various different forms is now transformed into Bloch's culminating feminine symbol, that of Rodina, his motherland. He speaks of Russia with an unparalleled depth of feeling as a lover speaking of his beloved. In the magnificent poem on Kulikova Field, he addresses her as his wife, O Rus Maya, Jena Maya, in these poems, he vocally declares his love of Russia for all her faults and tries to capture 
uh, precious music. For according to him, Russia was still a bearer of music, unlike the dead civilization of the West. With the Rodina cycle, the beautiful lady and the power of nature are reinterpreted as my fateful native country, Rakavaya Radnaya Strana. The theme of Russia appears in the three poems we are now going to read on Kulikova Field, Russia, and those born in years of stagnation. The first of these on Kulikova Field comprises a cycle of five poems written between June and December 1908, in which Bloch addresses himself to Russia's heroic past. In this heroic past, Bloch saw both signs of Russia's future suffering and the assurance of eventual triumph. The cycle represents a mystical interpretation of the Battle of Kulikova Field, which was fought in 1380. In this battle, the Moscow princes under Dmitry Danskoy defeated the Tatars under Khan Mamai. The Kulikova Field cycle is regarded by many as Bloch's highest poetic achievement. Uh, Lucy will now read the first poem uh, from the cycle on Kulikova Field. On Kulikova Field. The river spreads out wide, washing its banks as it flows mournfully and sluggishly. Above, above the cliff's meagre yellow clay, haystacks sta sadly stand. Russia, my wife, our long way is painfully clear. Our way, like the arrow of ancient Tatar freedom, has pierced our breast. Our way is that of the steps of unlimited grief, of your grief. O oh, Russia, even night's alien darkness I do not fear. Let night fall, we'll race on to our goal. We'll light up the distant steps with our bivouac fires. Our sacred banner and the steel of the Khan's sabre will glitter through the haze of the steps. Eternal battle. We can only dream of rest glimpsed through blood and dust. A mare flies across the steps, trampling the grass. No end in sight. The miles flash by. Cliffs appear. Stop! The storm clouds flee in terror. Blood red sunset in the sky. Blood red sunset in the sky, and blood flows from the heart. Weep, heart, weep. There's no rest, and the mare flies, galloping across the step. На поле Куликовом Река раскинулась, Течет, грустит лениво, И моет берега. Над скудной глиной желтого обрыва В степи грустят стога. О, Русь моя, жена моя, Да боли нам ясен долгий путь. Наш путь стрелой татарской древней воли Пронзил нам грудь. Наш путь степной, Наш путь в тоске безбрежной, В твоей тоске, о Русь. И даже мглы ночной и зарубежной Я не боюсь. Пусть ночь, домчимся, Озарим кострами степную даль. В степном дыму Блеснет святое знамя И ханской сабли сталь. И вечный бой, Покой нам только снится Сквозь кровь и пыль. Летит 
летит степная ковылица и мнет ковыль. И нет конца. Мелькают версты, кручи, останови. Идут, идут испуганные тучи, закат в крови. Закат в крови, из сердца кровь струится, плач сердце, плач, покоя нет. Степная кобылица несется в скач. The second of the poems which we are going to read on the theme of Russia is actually titled Russia. In the poem, Bloch turns from the heroic past to the impoverished Russia of the present and reaffirms his faith in Russia's ability to overcome her enemies and to survive. Russia. Oh, Russia, destitute Russia, to me your grey log huts and songs of the wind are like the first tears of love. Pity I cannot feel for you. I must bear my cross with care. Bestow your savage beauty on any charmer you wish. Let him seduce you and deceive you. Though care may cloud your lovely features, you will not fade away or vanish. What of it? One more care? With one more tear, the river swells. But you are always the same, your fields and forests, an embroidered kerchief on a woman's brow. And the impossible becomes possible, and the journey easy no long, when on the distant road two eyes for an instant brightly shine from beneath a kerchief, when the yearning of captivity rings out in the coachman's mournful song. Россия в сокращении Россия Нищая Россия, мне избы серые твои, Твои мне песни ветровые, как слезы первые любви. Тебя жалеть я не умею, и крест свой бережно несу, Какому хочешь, чародею, отдай разбойную красу. Пускай заманит и обманет, Не пропадешь, не сгинешь ты, И лишь забота затуманит Твои прекрасные черты. Ну что ж, одной заботой боли, Одной слезой река шумней, А ты все та же, лес, до поля, до плат узорный добр, добровей. И невозможное возможно. Дорога долгая, легка. Когда блеснет вдали дорожной Мгновенный взор из-под платка. Когда звенит Тоской острожной глухая песня ямщика. The third of these poems on the theme of Russia is those born in years of stagnation. This poem was written uh, soon after the beginning of the First World War. It's dedicated to the symbolist poet and critic Zinaida Gipios. Gipios considered it the best poem Bloch had written. The poet speaks here 
as the representative of a doomed generation, the children of Russia's terrible years. That is, those born in the 1880s. Uh, Bloch did not in fact write many poems after this, none between 1916 and 1918, and only a few between 1918 and 1921. We'll now read this poem. Uh, to Zinaida Gippius. Those born in years of stagnation cannot recall their way. We, the children of Russia's terrible years, cannot forget anything at all. Years that turned everything to ashes. Do you bring tidings of madness or hope? On our faces, there's a bloody reflection of days of freedom and days of war. We are struck dumb. The toll of the church bell demands all lips be sealed. In hearts which were once in rapture, there is now a fateful void. And even though above our deathbed, croaking ravens rise. Lord, let those who are worthier than us set their eyes upon thy kingdom. Зинаиде Николаевне Гиппиус. Рожденные в года глухие пути не помнят своего. Мы, дети страшных лет России, забыть не в силах ничего. Испепеляющие годы Безумие ли в вас, надежды ли весь, От дней войны, от дней свободы Кровавый отцвет в лицах есть. Есть немота, то гул набата Заставил заградить уста. В сердцах восторженных когда-то есть роковая пустота. И пусть над нашим смертным ложем Взовьется с криком воронье. Те, кто достойней, Боже, Боже, да узрят царствие Твое. Before we move on to the last few years of Bloch's life, it's worth turning back for a moment to the historical events of the second decade of the 20th century. The First World uh, broke out in August 1914. This was interpreted by Bloch as a further step towards the, ap the apocalyptic catastrophe, which was soon to engulf the world. Initially, Bloch had no desire to fight in what seemed to him to be a senseless struggle leading to mutual destruction for both sides. Finally, though, he did in fact enlist in the Russian army in 1916. Uh, you can see Bloch there, he's the third uh, person from the, from the left. He was stationed at the front uh, near Pskov until March 1917. Anna Akhmatova recalls how her husband, Nikolai Gumilyov, commented to her that sending Bloch to the front would be like frying nightingales. Uh, Bloch's wife, Lubov, um, worked behind the lines as a nurse's aide. In Russia itself, 
As we know, the Bolsheviks seized power in the October Revolution of 1917, pledging to end the war with Germany, no matter what concessions they had to make. Eventually, on the 3rd of March, 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed between the Bolsheviks and Germany. The next poem we're going to read is an extract from the Scythians, Skifi. Bloch wrote this poem almost immediately after his famous poem, The Twelve, on the 29th and 30th of January, 1918. The Twelve is an inspirational work, a wholly spontaneous expression of Bloch's poetic genius. The Scythians, by contrast, is a rationally conceived, essentially didactic or rhetorical work. It belongs to the Russian Odic tradition and critics have indicated in particular its similarities to Pushkin's To the Slanderers of Russia. In this poem, Bloch reveals Russia's Eastern or Scythian or Asiatic dimension. As in, Bloch's, uh, as in Pushkin's poem, the slanderers of Russia are the Western powers. The poem is a solemn warning addressed to the revolution's Western opponents who had been angered by the Bolshevik government's separate peace treaty negotiations with Germany. The poet threatens the Western powers that unless they respond to Russia's call for peace and friendship, she will withdraw from her historical role of buffer state between East and West, shielding the West against aggression from the East and leave them at the mercy of the Asiatic hordes. Uh, Lucy will now read the final st uh, stanzas of the Scythians and then Allah will read in Russian. The Scythians. Come to us. From the horrors of war, come into our peaceful embrace. Before it's too late, sheathe your old sword. Comrades, let us all be brothers. And if not, we have nothing to lose and we are not above treachery. For centuries and centuries, you will be cursed by your sickly descendants. We'll spread out through the woods and forests in front of handsome Europe, and then turn to you with our Asiatic muscles. All of you go, go to the Urals. We're clearing the battlefield there between steel machines designed by science and the wild Mongolian horde. But we are your shield no longer. From now on, we won't engage in battle. We'll watch the fight to the death with our narrow eyes. For the last time, old world, come to your senses, to a brotherly feast of labor and peace. For the last time, to a joyous brotherly feast, the barbarian lyre is calling. Skiffy, Akanchani. Придите к нам от ужасов войны, придите в мирные объятия. Пока не поздно, старый меч в ножны, товарищи, мы станем братья. А если нет, нам нечего терять, и нам доступно вероломство. Века, века вас будет проклинать больное позднее потомство. Мы широко подебрем и лесам перед Европою пригожей расступимся. Мы обернемся к вам своею азиатской рожей. Идите все! Идите на Урал, мы очищаем место бою стальных машин, где дышит интеграл с монгольской дикою ордою. Но сами мы 
Отныне вам не щит, Отныне в бой не вступим сами. Мы поглядим, как смертный бой кипит Своими узкими глазами. В последний раз опомнись, старый мир, На братский пир труда и мира В последний раз на светлый братский пир Взывает варварская лира. We now move on to the fifth stage of Bloch's poetic development, the revolution. Bloch greeted the February 1917 revolution with undoubted enthusiasm. Then with the revolution of October 1917, he saw or thought he saw the realization of his hopes and prophecies. Initially, he had great hopes of the revolution. He worked for the provisional government's commission investigating the records of Tsarist ministers, and he worked for various Soviet institutions. In 1920, he was elected chairman of the Petrograd division of the All-Russian Union of Poets. However, he never joined the Communist Party. In the immediate aftermath of the revolution, Bloch was close to the left socialist revolutionaries, the SRs, or SRI in Russian. Indeed, in February 1919, he was briefly arrested in connection with the so-called conspiracy of the left SRs. The last two years of Bloch's life were marked by his profound disillusionment with the reality of the revolution. Ultimately, he came to see the revolution as a failure, the product of abstract economic theories of bourgeois intellectuals who had no real contact with or understanding of ordinary people. Apathy, despair, hard living conditions, and a mysterious unidentified illness led to his early death at the age of 40 on the 7th of August, 1921. This was after all attempts by his wife and friends uh, to obtain permission for him to go abroad to recuperate were refused by the Bolshevik government. Lenin personally ordered that no exit visa should be issued for Bloch. He was probably afraid that Bloch would never return to Russia. His death was a painful and agonizing one. And he finally died after a, a succession of heart attacks. The funeral rites were held in the Church of the Resurrection in the Smolenskoye Cemetery. He had stopped writing poetry some time before his death. The music of the world around him had simply stopped. And the poet dies because he cannot breathe. As Bloch himself said of Pushkin in his address on the anniversary of Pushkin's death in February 1921. The acmeist poet Nikolai Gumilyov also died in August 1921 executed by the Bolshevik regime. These two deaths had a shattering effect on literary St. Petersburg. Andrei Bieli announced that Bloch had, quotes, choked to death in the suffocating atmosphere of St. Petersburg in 1921. Returning uh, to 1917, the revolution inspired one of Bloch's greatest poems. The first and arguably still the greatest poetic work devoted to the revolution, the 12. The poem was and is Bloch's best known work. It's considered by most to be an extraordinary evocative and effective poem, expressing the essence of the Russian revolution at its time. We can hardly do justice uh, to the poem in the time available to us, but it's worth making a few remarks. First, a few uh, words about Bloch's attitude uh, to the revolution. 
He was criticized by many friends and admirers for his unequivocal acceptance of the revolution at its outset. However, it's important to understand the nature of Bloch's initial support for the revolution. At the time of the abortive revolution of 1905, it was clear from what Bloch and André Bielli had written at the time that the revolution they both had in mind was spiritual and social rather than political or even civic. Similarly, the revolution to which Bloch responded in 1917 and 1918 was only incidentally political. Rather, his idealistic hope was that it would somehow bring about the spiritual transfiguration of Russia. And then just coming back briefly to the 12, it's obviously a work that has always aroused controversy. The point to make about the poem though, is that it allows of different and mutually contradictory interpretations. It's a, it's a brilliant poem um, and I recommend it to anyone who's not read it or heard it uh, read. Uh, the protagonists of the poem, the 12 Red Guardsmen, embody Bloch's conception of the Russian people. Crude, violent, and undisciplined, they are driven by the single desire for revenge on the bourgeoisie. One of the most remarkable features of the poem is the sudden appearance of Christ at the very end of the poem, at the head of the column of Red Guardsmen. Bloch himself, was unable to explain the significance of the appearance of Christ in logical terms, but felt he had no choice in the matter. Whatever the poem's real meaning may be thought to be, it was certainly inspired by the revolution and remains a great poem. It's perhaps worth noting that Bloch himself eventually disowned the Twelve once he had seen with his own eyes where the revolution was heading. To those who praised his poem, he replied, I don't know the 12. The 12 and the Scythians are often considered to have been the last flash of Bloch's genius. However, it's better to consider the last expression of Bloch's muse to have been in his very last poem, to Pushkin House, and in his famous speech on Pushkin, on the poet's calling, or Naznachenie Paeta. He wrote the poem on the same day that he made the speech, the 11th of February, 1921. Bloch delivered this speech as Dostoevsky had done in 1880 on the anniversary of Pushkin's death. 1921 was the 84th anniversary. In both the poem and the speech, the poet, nobly and with great vigor, expressed his protest against tyranny and praised the secret inner freedom which stands up to the power of petty totalitarianism. Bloch spoke as follows, and it's worth uh, quoting his words. What killed Pushkin was not Dantes's bullet. What killed him was lack of air. There is no happiness in the world, but there is peace and freedom. Peace and freedom. They are essential to the poet for the feeling of harmony, but peace and freedom too are being taken away. Not an external peace, but a creative one. Not a poor owl freedom, the freedom to play the liberal, but the creative freedom, the secret inner freedom. The poet dies because he can no longer breathe. Life for him has lost its meaning. We are dying, but art will remain. And so the poetry of Bloch lives on and through it, the spirit of Pushkin. Uh, throughout all its stages, the five stages I've outlined, Bloch's poetry was imbued with a wholehearted acceptance of the Pushkinian tradition. Thus, Bloch's poem, To Pushkin House, may fittingly be considered his last testament. In 
In conclusion, we can celebrate the fact that Alexander Bloch was a great lyric poet, the greatest of the Russian symbolist poets, and a poet who continued the great tradition of Russian poetry. He was the first great Russian poet of the 20th century who exercised a profound influence on his contemporaries and successors. In the words of Anna Akhmatova, he was a monument to the beginning of the century. Pamyatnik na Chalu Vyeka. As Tchuchiv had said of Pushkin, so Marina Svetaeva said of Bloch, as with a first love, Russia will never forget you in her heart. Tibia kak pievu lubov, rasi serce, nie I think that in the Pushkin Club, and indeed with this event being hosted by Pushkin House, we could not really end with a more fitting poem than to Pushkin House. To Pushkin House. The name of Pushkin House in the Academy of Science has a clear and familiar sound full of meaning to our hearts. It's the sound of drifting ice on the majestic river. It's one steamship hailing another in the distance. It's the ancient Sphinx gazing at the slow retreating waves. It's the bronze horseman flying on his steed that never moves. Our impassioned sorrows above the mysterious Neva, when we met the black day after the fiery white night. What flame-lapped distant vistas the river opened up before us. But it was not those days we called, but the ages yet to come. We let the brief deception of our oppressive days slip by. We could see the distant future in a blue and rosy haze. Pushkin, following in your traces, we sang praises to inner freedom. Give us your hand in this time of trouble. Help us in our silent struggle. Was it not the sweetness of your sounds which inspired us in those days? Was it not your joy, Pushkin, which gave us wings in those days? That is why the name of Pushkin House in the Academy of Science has a sound so familiar and dear to our hearts. That is why in the hour of my sunset, as I step out into the dark of night to the name of Pushkin House from the snow white Senate Square, I quietly bow. Pushkinskomu Dom. Имя Пушкинского дома в Академии наук. Звук понятный и знакомый, не пустой для сердца звук. Это звон или дохода на торжественной реке, перекличка парохода с пароходом вдалеке. Это древний сфинкс, глядящий Вслед медлительной волне Всадник бронзовый, Летящий на недвижном скакуне. Наши страстные печали Над таинственной невой. Как мы черный день встречали Белой ночью огневой. Что за пламенные дали Открывала нам река, но не эти дни мы звали, а грядущие века, пропуская дней гнетущих кратковременный обман, прозревали дней грядущих синий-розовый туман. Пушкин, тайную свободу пели мы во след тебе, 
дай нам руку в непогоду, помоги в немой борьбе. Не твоих ли звуков сладость вдохновляла в те года? Не, твои, не твоя ли Пушкин радость окрыляла нас тогда? Вот зачем такой знакомый и родной для сердца звук имя Пушкинского дома в Академии наук. Вот зачем в часы заката, уходя в ночную тьму, с белой площади Сената низко кланяюсь ему. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your, your patience. Thank you, David. Um, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> but, um, it is quite late, but um, I, I think we're all absolutely um, thrilled to have had the, the evening. And um, I personally, I, I really loved the Nieznakonka. Um, Uh, most of all, I, I found that absolutely fascinating. I hadn't heard it before or read it, so it's, um, it was completely new to me. And um, in fact, almost all of them were. Um, and I'm really very thankful to you, David, for organizing and to Lucy and Alla for, for reading. And Thank many you. people in the comments are also uh, share those uh, sentiments. Um, so let's see if we get any, uh, any questions. Um, Oh, very happy to to answer them. Well, we've we've always loved Block. It's um it's just wonderful poetry, and I, I hope the musicality, um and and the visual aspect um came across with the selection. Um, it's always difficult to select. There are other poems one would have liked to have included, but I think it was a reasonably good cross section. Um, yeah, absolutely, and it gave a great uh, chronology of his uh, his life and uh, the trajectories that he sort of went through artistically. Yes, those, those stages, I mean, one can overdo that sort of, um, as I said, the classification, but it, it just helps to give a bit of a, a sort of um, framework for it. Hmm. Okay, here's a question. Would you say well, Milton had any influence on Bloch? Yeah. Yes, Alan? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. There is no evidence. It could be, but no definite evidence about that. It's a very interesting question. Yes, maybe we should dig. We, we have to <laughs> dig some deeper, more research. Yes. yes. Do you think uh, you could tell any any other um, influences that he had had? had? Um, you mentioned, obviously, um, philosophical ones, but do you think there are any uh, sort of um, authors who were very strong influences on him? That's not a good question. Well, obviously, Pushkin. I, I would say the whole, um, the whole of sort of Russian poetry, he would have been steeped, or he was steeped in that. And um, I mean, the classical tradition, I think he particularly was interested in. As Mandelstam said, he um, he kept to quite a strict form, was not experimental. But I'm not aware of a specific poet apart from Pushkin, who I would say you could could see an influence. Would you, Alan, say? What? A, a, a particular a writer or a poet. We, I mean, we mentioned well, obviously Lerman, uh, Pushkin, I can't just, that doesn't come to me, but uh, Lermontov's influence, oh. it was overwhelming. Oh, in, yeah, yeah. in many poems, yes. And Fiat, of course. Fiat for in his early poetry, because Ante Luchim, actually, his first collection of poems, Ante Luchim, Before the Light, it was inspired by Fiat. And yeah. firstly, he was considered as just the Fiat uh, follower. 
but of course he <laughs> went much further than he had any dream to go. <laughs> I've got a slightly silly thing to say, but just in when we were doing, when you were doing the last um, poem to um, Pushkin House, I remembered that many years ago when Pushkin House and the Pushkin Club lived in Ladbrook Grove and we had a kind of poetry slam um, where members read their own poetry and we even had somebody from the embassy uh, in a kind of Macintosh, but he came and read his own poems and um, I don't remember the name. It was a blonde woman who may be in the audience, I don't know, uh, who was very, very lovely. And she had written a poem that said that the words of which the first line was, when I come to Pushkin House, I see angels dancing on my fingertips. <laughs> I oh. just remembered that. I thought you'd like to know. That was our Pushkin House. Oh, yes. Yeah. So did, did Blocks, um, do you think Blocks... Uh, Ode to Pushkin House influenced um, by Vyacheslav Ivanov. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Of course, they, they were fellow travelers, symbolists, but I think uh, I think it was vice versa. <laughs> I think that's in relation to oh, uh, Anthony. I think Anthony has a question, um, but I think what Allah was just referring to was in relation to the question, was there any sense that the... Ivanov, you know, of course, um, was guru for younger generation, but Bloch was yeah. not think, interested yeah. in just such formal <laughs> discussions about symbolism and so on, so Again, it could be. So next year there is a blocks, the anniversary of the blocks death. So we could dig into the <laughs> yeah. Mil Milton and Vyacheslav Ivanov and <laughs> things <laughs> deliver. Yeah. That's a promise. <laughs> well, yes, on a particular theme. Um, but we haven't done a lot on block, and uh, I feel he's somewhat underappreciated and. Um, the quality of his verse speaks for itself. Absolutely. I mean, there are dozens of poems. One of the first, what, partly why I like Bloch when I started studying Russian poetry and, and Pushkin and Lyamatov, obviously, but Bloch was one of the first poets I read. And um, he spoke to me. There's a, there's a poem called In the Dunes, Dune. And it's not particularly symbolic or significant of anything great, but it's just such a lyrical treatment of a man and a woman just running in the sand dunes, sand dunes on the Baltic coast. And it's really powerful and beautiful, uh, and it's very musical. Uh, I think we have a question from Anthony Wood. Uh, no, Rilke, no. Uh, um, I don't think Rilke, it's Svetaeva and Pasternak, not Blok. This is a revelation to me, David, this choice of Blok. Uh, um, and it, I, was, it, I was astonished to think that um, compared to other Russian 20th century poets, um, there's, I can't trace or re recall or any um, English language reception or, or count of Bloch like, like you can see in um, Pasternak, Mandel, yes. Driver, sit, um, um, the, the, the block seems to. Uh, it is interesting because you... for the English poetry reading public. Uh, so I wonder when, when, when you, do you, do you trace that he broke through to any kind of English audience? Oh, I don't think uh, he sorry, has broken before through. Before David answers, I just not to forget. Oh, yeah. uh, it was a lot, a lot of Scandinavian evidence uh, influence in Bloch's poems. Now you can yeah. talk about English. I do. <laughs> well, uh, and I can't think of anyone who who shows uh, the, the influence of Bloch. I mean, maybe there is. Uh, I, I, it, it has to come through translation, and I, I, I don't know anything about who translated Bloch 
first into English, substantially, if anyone. Right. David Brennan. Yeah, right. <laughs> I translated those tonight, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, uh, it, it is strange he hasn't, he hasn't broken through because his persona, I would have thought, was a rather attractive one. The, the, a, the romantic poet, yes. and his, um, his very interesting life, his, yes. his dabbling in philosophy and um, interesting yes. in, interested in um, quite sort of um, philosophical subjects and the revolution. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a social conscience. So all of those attributes you would have thought would appeal to the English public. But but say I mean, apart from Pasternak and say maybe Akhmatova, um, and, and maybe Brodsky recently have so, say is Mandelstam well known to the the British public? I yes, say because that. of his yes. because of Nadezhda Mandelstam. Because of Nadezhda, yeah. Yeah. And can I ask a question? Of course, yes. I'm going to ask who do you think has best translated Block into the English language? <laughs> I mean, like, not one person, obviously, but, yeah. for example, the greatest poem, 12. Who, who, what, what, what translation into English would you recommend? I can, I can mention, but not recommend, but I'll just mention for the record, someone called Woodward, who did a uh, bilingual translation, I mean, bilingual edition. That I, would I be lovely. I, Woodward. I, 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 I don't think the translation is, in literary terms, tops. It doesn't hit you. It, 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 it just sort of relates to the parallel Russian text. But that, that's the only translation I can think of, of, of the 12. It's a fabulous poem. And I, um, I do speak Russian, so I have this um, hmm, Penguin edition. There's quite a good translation in there. Uh, oh, who's that by that one? Uh, sorry, uh, Penguin Russian uh, Poetry. You mean it's um, Penguin Alexander Bloch's selected poems, and uh, the last one is the 12. And I don't know who it's by, my husband gave it to me anyway. What, what, oh, what year was that? Well, sorry, that's uh, a question, yeah. it's a collection. Oh, when was it published? Uh, oh, hang on. <laughs> I've got no light in here. Hang on. Uh, blah, blah, blah. No, the question about 1970, the blog. 1970. Uh-huh. It's a collection um, of That's blog very poems. Very interesting date. 1970 or 1917? 1970. 1970. 1970. <laughs> 7 <-0. laughs> yeah. I'm talking to the people about your post, your book. Yeah, no. Come so, and talk. So I was just saying, what's the best translation of the twelve? Yeah, hi. Thank you. I I, I was on the call earlier and uh, dropped off about fifteen minutes ago, um, but I've been fascinated by uh, the discussion this evening, and I was working off a book produced in nineteen sixty seven uh, by um, uh, someone called Woodward, uh, the kind of selected poems of Alexander Block. Uh, and also this uh, Penguin Modern European Poets, Alexander Block's Selected Poems, which I think I spent, I, I paid 70p for it. <laughs> and I think that was, that was produced in 1974. 70, um, so, 1970. Uh, copyright John Stallworthy. Peter Franz, Peter Franz. Ah. Yeah, it was translated from the Russian by John Stallworthy and Peter Franz. I think one of whom was a Russianist and one of whom was a a serious poet. Uh, uh, France and uh, um, uh, the other poet, the top, top translator. Oh, were they? Yeah. Oh. So your recommendation yeah, is Woodward. Woodward. I will look no, that I, up. I recommend, I'm just saying it's a parallel text. Uh, I, um, that's I like a parallel text because yeah, I like I, to read the Russian alongside. Yeah, I'm so more interested perfect. in what you've said, um, Peter France and um, Stall, John Stallworthy. I mean, that, that sounds very promising to me uh, for, for, to translate Block. Uh, uh, we have, yes, um, I just kind of want to get the last couple of questions in before we uh, have to finish. But there's a, an interesting question here from Jane. 
Bloch's roles as a stenographer in 1917 seems to have silenced his poetry. How do you feel this feeds, or do you feel this feeds directly into the way he writes the 12 and the Christ figure possibly representing justice? Um, what, would, uh, what would any of the panelists uh, have to say to that? No, but first, Bloch stopped writing in 1916 before the revolution, so it's not a stenographer work. And the Christ, he, ne he couldn't explain uh, himself. He just felt that he couldn't do without Christ. And <laughs> there is a lot of interpretations of the role of Christ. Is it justice or the, <laughs> the ultimate... Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, just despite all the revolutions, blood and uh, cruelty, uh, it, it is uh, right thing uh, for 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 Russia. That's why Christ, Heidinkin. But uh, it's not coming from block, only from uh, critics, interpreters, and in his time, because no, nobody could understand it when during the public readings, it was interchanged of Peridi idiot matros instead of Peridi idiot Christos. The sailor, <laughs> the Navy sailor is <laughs> going in, in front of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm sure the Soviets didn't really like it, um, given that the atheism uh, in the following years. Um, so it is, it is very enigmatic, isn't it? Yeah. Um, look. Yeah. We had a, a group who staged it at Pushkin House, you may recall, uh, three or four years ago, um, a theatrical pre a representation of the 12. Um, it was absolutely brilliant. They really brought it to life. I think so I, I, th I think it's wonderful, wonderful poem, whatever one's views on the revolution as, as, a, as a piece of creative work. It's extraordinary. Well, next year, we will obviously do have a different approach, maybe select one or two different themes. Um, and it would be highly appropriate, as it's the, um, that's, yeah, it's, uh, commemorating his death. Well, it's a pity that this question can't be saved. Well, um, they will actually be uh, downloaded. Um, the, the chat gets, when we download our uh, video, the chat gets saved. So I can I can keep it as a kind of... Yeah, um, because it's very useful just for future yeah. uh, meetings, yes. To, uh, yeah, well, we can answer these questions, yes. Yeah, I think yeah. Block is absolutely underappreciated and we'd be very happy to hear more of him. We've um, had a couple of Pushkin readings. I think we can branch out a little bit. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. And <laughs> what's, our next, what's our next one, David? Well, it's the um, Mozart and Salieri. Um, but I mean, that's one, one major part of it. But we'll, we'll give you the... Um, we, we are discussing, several of us are discussing the, the kind of approach to it. In the light of contemporary events. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, we, we have the magnificent translation, honestly, by Anthony. It, I'm not just saying this to embarrass Anthony, but really it is outstanding. Mm. And it's a, it's a beautiful work. It's, um, and I think it, would, it lends itself well to, to Zoom. I mean, obviously better to have it live and physical performance, but insofar as we're doing things on Zoom, I think it would lend itself very well. And it um, has a very unusual aspect in that music is contained within it. Uh, and it's absolutely, well, it, it wasn't, in, we don't know what was in Pushkin's mind, but what he wrote created the, the opportunity of music with the words, embedded in the words, which is, I find very unusual in a poem. Yeah. More like an opera. Mm. Yep, the, the yep. 10th of November, isn't it? Yep, that's right. So we'll um, we'll see you again then. Yes, absolutely. So um, I think I think that just about wraps it up. So I'd like to thank um, all everyone who's who's uh, tuned in today. Um, 
as well as, as our uh, esteemed panelists. Um, <laughs> thanks, David, again for organizing this and to Ella for, for participating. It's always uh, really uh, an honor for us. And to everybody who's asked questions as well, thank you. And um, to our viewers on YouTube as well, thank you all very much. Thank and you. thank you, Rafi, for hosting it so impeccably, as always. Thanks, um, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank everybody, yeah. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Mark. <laughs> all right, well, um, I'm, I'm sure I'll speak to many of you uh, before we uh, see each other again. There are a lot of uh, um, very nice comments in the uh, in the chat there thanking everyone and um i'll uh, i'll see you all if i don't see you before on the 10th of november absolutely yes Thanks. yeah That's thank you rafi very much for thank, thank you <laughs> your great support rafi yes you're thank keeping you. pushkin alive the spirit of pushkin. <laughs> no very oh. much so yeah uh,